Matt is here to talk about home automation. So uh, we talked about wearables and how we can take the electronics that we l use and we have next door and build amazing things for our clothing, our attire, things that attach to our person. But people also live in homes. It's kind of what separates us from most animals. Um, so the, the next thing to separate us from the animals even more is to let the homes do the stuff for themselves. And so without further ado, home automation. Thanks. Again, I'm Matt Dobson. Uh, I've been, this is my first RobotsConf, so first time I've been out here. It's been a lot of fun so far. Um, I work at Apogee. They do API management for big enterprises. Um, but I have been doing maker stuff for about three years, so building robots, doing home automation projects, and all sorts of stuff. And uh, for about a year now at Apogee, we've kind of turned the little team I'm on uh, into a bunch of hackers and residents. So we've been figuring out how to give devices APIs and model them consistently and do some cool stuff. And the easiest way to start out with that is uh, home automation. So um, I'm going to go over all of that and kind of give a project that we did called IntelliChili, uh, just like a once over on how we designed it and how we built everything out. Uh, but first, a quick story. So um, when I was growing up, I loved Star Trek. I absolutely loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And um, it's really just relevant for two reasons. One is I wanted to do a Star Trek themed talk. Um, it's what really got me passionate about technology. All my favorite characters were the engineers that could like push the ship to the limit and come up with like really creative solutions to problems really quickly. And uh, the second one is, is like this is actually a really good example of like an ideal state of home automation. It's something that's kind of removed and you don't really notice it, but it's there and it's functional and it's solving problems for you. So not only is it you know, an awesome spaceship that can go really fast and fight a bunch of aliens and explore the universe, uh, it's also a really awesome floating automated home. Um, but back to home automation. So as you can see, this is kind of uh, an old school way of looking at home automation. Uh, it just really sets up temperatures in a house. And um, that's kind of a good way to just dive in. Um, find a problem that you want solved, something that bugs you about your surroundings, and solve it to the point where it's almost transparent, taken care of, and you don't have to put in a, a ton of effort to, to solve that problem. And um, for this, it's just setting schedules for your temperature. And uh, you know, it's just a CRT monitor. I don't know if it's touchscreen or not, but that would be awesome if it was one of those touchscreen CRTs. Um, and you just set temperature at certain times, and that solves a problem, automates your home, and uh, you have a good time. Really, there are three ways to go about the whole process. Uh, the first one is buying an out-of-box system like SmartThings. You can uh, just go to Best Buy, buy this kit. It will give you a hub and a bunch of sensors, and everything's kind of pre-configured for you. You download an app, and you can just get going. It's a, it's a really way easy way to dive in. Um, there's not much hackability to it, but it's a way for you to just kind of, you know, play around with stuff, see how it feels, see, you know, do you actually like an automated home? Is this something that you could solve problems with? Um, next is out-of-box devices that you use to build your own system. So instead of worrying about, like, engineering a bunch of hardware, making sure everything uh, works in, like, a full-stack perspective, you can buy a couple consumer devices that have, like, node modules or Python libraries, something there for you to be able to program them, but um, actually, you know, you don't have to worry about the hardware. It's all there, and you can write code against it. And uh, the last one, which I think is the most fun, is building your own system. So actually going out, buying Arduinos, maybe throwing in some consumer hardware, just full stack, build your whole system, write apps, do a bunch of crazy stuff, and uh, you know, have a robotic home, essentially. Um, so first things first, it's really about making things that are dumb smart. So it's turning your coffee pot into an Android that wears a cowboy hat. And um, the way you can do that is by actually augmenting the device and augmenting uh, the heating you know, for you know, the case of a coffee bot, augmenting the heating element. And uh, we actually did this with IntelliChili. Um, we actually bought a crock pot, just a really simple 
a KitchenAid crockpot with a heating element, a timer, and some basic controls. Cracked it open, uh, took out some of the, uh, you know, brains of it, I guess is the best way to put it, and put in an Arduino Yun and rewired everything to work with our circuitry. And this allowed us to, to control everything. So we uh, you know, put in the Arduino, we wrote the firmware, we wrote a layer to actually uh, create a web API. So instead of worrying about talking MQTT over the internet or co-app or one of those other protocols, we said, hey, we're going to have a hub that's a Raspberry Pi that connects to the internet, and that will handle uh, exposing a web API for us, like the Twitter API or the Facebook API, and then the hub, which lives in our local network, lives in our office, that will be responsible for talking the machine protocol. And that actually worked out pretty well for us. And uh, we actually had an app where we could turn stuff on and turn it off and uh, control it. Um, but the downside to it is you don't have a fully engineered product. So after a while, um, we would turn it on and let it run for a little bit, and smoke would start to come out of it, and it would smell really bad. So we kind of decided that it was a little dangerous and um, kind of put that product on the back burner a little bit. Um, so next, it's also about assimilating smart things. So you have the Hue, you have something like the Sonos or a Chromecast. Um, it's uh, like the Borg. You take these smart devices, you assimilate them into your system like the Borg would assimilate a an alien race, and um, you, know, you make it a part of it. You can program against it like you would normally, but it's a part of this whole system. And we did that too with IntelliChili. We actually um, took a bunch of Hue bulbs and every time our chili was done, uh, we didn't actually cook in it because of the smoke problem, um, it would start blinking and going crazy. And um, you know, we didn't have to build a, you know, a mesh network of light bulbs that could change colors. The Hue just gave that to us, and we ran with it. So uh, here's some consumer devices that if you want to get into this, uh, you know, playing with those and writing code against. These are the, my top three that I really like. Uh, the first one, obviously, the Philips Hue. Um, it's got a nice little gateway, creates a mesh network of light bulbs, and you can change color, saturation, um, brightness, all that great stuff. It's really easy to control, and it's really easy to write code against. They have SDKs for a bunch of different stuff. Uh, next is the Sonos Hi-Fi system. It's a wireless speaker that you can tell to play music. Um, this one has a really cool node library that you can actually just programmatically write code uh, against your Sonos and have it play music at specific times. I've had it play all kinds of music and change my Philips Hue, different colors. Um, and then the last one is the Belkin Wemo. So if you want to have a smart outlet and you don't want to take the time to pull out the wiring of your outlet, um, what you can do is just get a Belkin Wemo and there's a ton of node libraries and Python libraries out there to interact with it. And uh, you know this is probably the easiest way to make a consumer device that's dumb smarter um, by being able to control when it turns on and off. Um, some other things to consider when you're doing home automation stuff, a lot of questions that came up when we were doing experiments were um, what, what to write your system in. You know, what, you know, there's a lot of coding platforms out there like Java and Objective-C, Python, Ruby, Node.js. You know, what, what do you want to write it in? Um, next is where will your code live? So if it's not C and you don't have micro, con you know, if you don't have something more powerful than a microcontroller, it could be really hard to write your platform of uh, choice onto the microcontroller and actually have it run. And uh, what about APIs? So um, I come from a mobile development background, along with the making background, and um, APIs has really have really made you know the world a better place. It's really easy to interact with data sets out on the web and perform actions on behalf of a user or for yourself to actually like do things. So, you know, send a tweet, write a post on Facebook, make a friend on Facebook, look up locations on Foursquare. And how can we actually put that whole paradigm of thinking into turn on my light, you know, check if my washer is done? Those are some important questions. So uh, how we solved those problems, we wrote our systems in Node, Node.js, JavaScript. Um, we put our code that actually ran, like the JavaScript, on Raspberry Pis and BeagleBones that did a really good job of you know, hosting the code. And we could eke out performance on those boards really easily. And then we used a special kind of API called a hypermedia API to kind of 
um, robustly describe our devices. And I'll go all into all three of these decisions. First one, Node.js. Uh, we chose this because it's async and evented, which is really good for accessing things over a home automation network. You can just send out a message and wait for something to come back saying, hey, this is good, hey, this is bad, or wait for events to pop up and you know, react to them. Um, there's actually a ton of libraries for interacting with devices, and I don't think um, this gets mentioned enough when talking about the technical merits of Node. Um, being able to have a wide community that's interested in a bunch of different things is awesome because I don't think we've actually had to write a hardware access layer in JavaScript because usually somebody out there has already done it in Node, and it's pretty good. It's pretty well supported. Um, the fourth thing is that JavaScript is fun. I have a lot of fun writing JavaScript. I really enjoy it, and uh, it's something that I can get stuff done really fast. And um, everybody on our team has a pretty large knowledge of JavaScript, so um, it just works out really, really well for us. So for our code host, like I said, we used BeagleBones and Raspberry Pis, and that was to stick to a hub and spoke model where we have a smart hub that could actually run this code and manage the state of dumber devices and expose an API. So we have our node running on like a BeagleBone or a Raspberry Pi. It will speak specific protocols to devices, everything from creating a mesh Zigbee network down to, you know, you plug in a USB cable and you speak for Mata to an Arduino. And that, uh, that was something that we really, really liked, and it's something that is a design pattern we've kind of stuck to um, since the IntelliChile project. Um, the hub talks to the devices, like I said, exposes an API, so you can actually just make web requests um, on the API side. And um, these are the three boards that we've specifically worked with. Uh, BeagleBone, the Intel Edison, and the Raspberry Pi. Um, BeagleBone is really awesome because it's open source, and uh, it's really easy to work with using bone scripts. Uh, Edison is newer, and um, there's, there's a few kinks in it, but for the most part, um, I've really liked working with the Edison, having the built-in Wi-Fi and uh, the Bluetooth LE. That makes for a really nice uh, smart home hub. It has some just stuff out of box that you don't have to worry about that you would with a, with a BeagleBone. And then obviously a crowd favorite, which is the Raspberry Pi. And that's, that's good as well. I mean, it's, um, it's not open source, so it's kind of difficult because we have a couple of core tenants that we stick to inside of our team where we want everything to be open. But um, it still works really well as a hub. It's powerful enough to run Node. You can plug in any kind of protocol, either to the GPIO pins or to the USB hub, and be able to talk Zigbee, uh, Bluetooth LE, Wi-Fi, all that stuff. And um, it's, it's the most cost effective by far. Um, now the most interesting part, I like to think, because I'm kind of an API nerd, uh, we use a hypermedia API that is um, a special way of designing an API that takes all the good stuff about HTML and puts them into API design. So uh, what we do is we expose a bunch of links and affordances to do things on API objects. And what you can do is um, expose devices as simple state machines. So, you know, obviously a state machine for a light bulb would be, you know, has two states, on and off, has two transitions between those states, turn on and turn off. And um, using hypermedia, we can expose those affordances conditionally. It will say, you know, hey, this device is in the off state. We're going to render it saying our state is off. The only action that we can do is turn it on. And uh, that will come back in the API response. And the API response will change based on you know, what you do with the device. Um, it also allows a consistent HTTP model to be exposed. So we can actually just refer back to a standard. We use something called Siren. Uh, to model everything, we can say, hey, we chose this because this is how it works in Siren. And there's you know, a really just methodical way of designing the API. And then um, at the very end of the day, you have an HTTP API for your device. So then it's just like writing any other kind of API client. It's just like sending a tweet to Twitter, sending a post to Facebook, um, or looking up locations on Foursquare. You can um, just use git, post, put, and delete, uh, and interact with devices in a programmatic way. So here's my shameless plug. Uh, we took all of this uh, stuff that we've learned over the year, and we actually built a framework called Zeta. And what Zeta does is it kind of encapsulates that whole hub and spoke pattern. 
allows you to expose an API and uh, allows you to communicate with uh, devices on the node level on the other end. And um, we're giving workshops, and, and uh, I don't, we might do one of an, uh, another talk about it. But um, yeah, we're giving workshops. Come check us out. We're giving away free BeagleBone Blacks if you, uh, you know, hang out and tool with Zeta. Um, yeah, so BeagleBone Black. That's a great question. So we, we started out with the state machine aspect being kind of a best practice, and it eventually became a pattern that was uh, so useful that we did incorporate it into Zeta. So Zeta will actually, all the things that I listed, it's, be, it's Node, it's completely open source. Um, it exposes that hypermedia API, and you just write some JavaScript using a state machine definition, and it will take care of conditionally rendering that API for you. And uh, then you know, it does the hub and spoke model by incorporating a hardware access layer that might live on, you know, it has to live in the hub in hardware, and then you need to be able to access it from Node. Yeah. Is there anybody else using that kind of state machine uh, abstraction layer? Or... Um, that's a great question. I don't know. I haven't run into another framework that is. Um, I'm really curious if somebody else does, um, because that would be awesome to swap notes and see, you know, what the limitations are on their end and obviously show off what the limitations are on our end. Um, a lot of uh, frameworks actually conform to like a pub sub message bus, you know, pass a message up, wait for a message to come back down. All right, thank you very much, Matt. And you'll be available in the hacker space, right? For yeah, correct. So if you come uh, see us at the home automation booth, uh, like I said, we're gonna be giving uh, Zeta demo, well, you build the demo and um, you get to keep it. So yeah, come hang out with us and uh, ask us questions and build stuff. All right, thank you very much. Thanks.